Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday. It's our media briefing where we talk about what's happening with COVID-19 in the county and across the area. Give updates, try and provide good information for people in this community to um, learn about what's happening and to know where we're going with COVID-19 in, um, in this area. It is also Earth Day and it's also Administrative Professionals Day. So my, um, my comments about Earth Day would be that we are very fortunate to have a beautiful place in which we all get to live, including in this Eau Claire community. And I personally benefit from an amazing group of administrative professionals, and um, you know they're the they're the glue that makes things work. So I am sure that is true for many of you in your work worlds. And um, another day to pay attention to that, although every day it's important. A lot of work continues to happen related to COVID-19 in this community with um, broad uh, partnerships that are critical for us to successfully manage the disease, but more importantly, work together as a community to step through this successfully. Um, we have a lot of new guidance um, at the state level. There are daily new resources being developed um, internationally, but nationally and at a state level. And at a local level, we are taking those and making sure that we are employing best practice and we are making things work in this community um, so we have success. Today we also have two guests um, after I give a little bit of an overview, um, Dave Miner from the Chamber of Commerce and uh, Dale Peters from the City of Eau Claire will be giving some additional updates. Dale has been functioning as our liaison officer in Incident Command and he is working on a special effort now related to economic um, revitalization with our um, next steps with COVID-19. Status update in Wisconsin, we have 49,502 negative tests for COVID-19. As a state, there are 4,845 confirmed COVID positive cases, um, an increase of 225 cases, 1,302 hospitalizations, about 26% of those that have been identified as COVID positive and 246 people have died of COVID-19, an increase of four since Tuesday. The 225 is an increase from the kind of steady numbers that we've been getting in the 120s to 160s. Um, we are having increased testing, so we anticipate some increased um, positives over time. Um, but it is something that the state I know is watching and talked about today on a state call. In Eau Claire, we have now have 23 confirmed cases of COVID-19, an increase of one since Monday when we last spoke. Our testing numbers are at 1,638 individuals tested that are Eau Claire County residents. 1,550 of those are negative test results. The remainder, 65, are pending. Again, we have a wide range of positive um, cases, types of cases in our community from very young to very old. Um, and we continue to track um, and learn about where those cases potentially have contracted COVID-19. Again, most of our cases are related to travel and um, many more cases in the beginning of the um, safer at home order. Um, some of our newer cases we're still investigating, but there may be the beginning of a sense of a bit of a community spread. We certainly are seeing that in other counties that that spread at a community level Level, including recently in Clark County, a very small county, a neighboring county with increasing numbers related to community spread. A couple of additional updates. Um, hospitals in this area and across the state are seeing that some individuals are choosing not to go in for emergency care because they are worried about COVID-19, worried about the capacity of hospitals. I want to make sure everybody knows that hospitals in this area and across the state are available and have capacity to treat emergency and urgent care issues. And we encourage people to not wait to receive that kind of care. COVID-19 is serious. Our hospitals have the capacity to do both. And we want people to remember that. 
We do regularly get questions as well about what is the capacity in this area for a COVID-19 surge. Surge meaning when our hospitals are not able to care for everybody that needs treatment. We've spoken about this a bit in the past, but available on the state website is some basic information about bed availability, basic information about ventilator availability. We have much more complex information also available within the region, but we are assured that our hospitals in this area, a regional footprint, they do serve not just Eau Claire County residents, but we work very closely with them. They have developed plans not only to increase their bed capacity from, what, from what's listed on the website um, within their walls, so surge available within their walls if we would get a sudden spike of COVID-19 cases, but also surge available in other locations. We also have identified a facility that could be used for additional capacity if we needed it outside of our existing footprint of healthcare institutions. Most of the models that we have right now are showing that we likely won't need that as long as we can keep that curves flattened. So again, our healthcare institutions, our healthcare partners are counting on us to keep that curve flat. It's why we're in the safer at home space right now, and it is why moving forward we need to be very strategic and safe about reopening. Overwhelming our healthcare system is one of the biggest concerns that we've seen at a national level, and we've seen that in some places where that has happened, and certainly in an international level, we've had examples of where that's happened, and that's what we're working uh, toward here, is that we don't have that challenge. So again, emergency rooms, urgent cares are available for emergencies and urgent health care issues. Please use them like you would at other times. Don't use them if you are not in an emergency or have an urgent care need. Um, we need that capacity always to be for the right purpose, use the right tool at the right time. Additionally, Ramadan begins tomorrow, and I just want to reiterate under the Safer at Home order and the extension that will start on Friday that um, we expect that gatherings for any purpose, including religious purposes, are under 10 people. Um, we really support people in practicing their, um, their religious traditions and what is important to them, but in a safe way, given what we have in our community at this point. Um, celebrations at home with your household members and celebrations that, if they happen in the community, are at a physical distance and are assured to be less than 10 people is critically important. We know that will stop the spread of disease. Also a reminder as it gets nicer outside that parks and open spaces are available for all of us to utilize. We have an amazing park system here in our cities and our county as a whole and those resources are available. Playgrounds are not open. Um, our campgrounds are not open in Eau Claire County. But we do have a lot of ability to use those spaces as households, and we encourage people to do that. Again, those gatherings are encouraged to just be people in your household, so you keep the opportunity to spread disease very, very small. As everybody knows, the new order came out from the governor, the new extension of the Safer at Home order. That will start on Friday. And just a couple of points um, today as a reminder of what we will be entering into as we move toward that Friday date. Um, first of all, some of the um, changes in services and operations that were indicated in that new order include public libraries being able to do curbside pickup of books and materials, um, golf courses being able to be open with some very specific requirements around them. Non-essential businesses now that haven't been able to operate at all now are able to do some minimum um, kinds of services. So they are able to do deliveries, mailings, and curbside pickups. That group of businesses that may be newly starting back up on Friday does have available resources from our incident command and we would 
be available to support them if they have questions. Again, calling the coronavirus um, the COVID-19 call center number, that 715-831-7425 number is, um, that number is available to help those businesses that may have questions about how to do that safely. We know all of those businesses that may be newly doing things want to do it in a way that their customers feel safe and they feel safe, and we are confident that that can happen. Arts and craft stores have an expanded ability to do curbside pickup um, and um, some of the exterior work that people may want done on their home or in their yard is also allowed as long as it's done by a single person. So those are some of the explicit changes in the new order. Um, also on Monday with the most recent order, the Badger Bounce Back order, there is again additional clarity about how we move from the order that will start Friday to the next phases where we progressively, strategically, and based on data move forward. And we certainly in Eau Claire are working hard on being ready for that and working hard to support our community so that if and when that data shows that we can do that, hopefully even before the date that is on the order and the governor sees that data showing us that we're ready to do that, that we have a possibility um, and we are ready if that possibility happens to safely open in Eau Claire as well. We know that businesses are enormously impacted. We talked on Friday and Monday about that as well. We have been working hard in Eau Claire to support businesses already. The essential um, businesses that are up and operational have been collectively receiving information as well as individually having many questions answered to make sure that they are doing things in a way that is safe and effective. We now are ratcheting that up and we are pleased that not only the planning section in our incident command has really done some deep thinking about the sectors that have been impacted by this, but that we also have some really good thinking with our partners um, across the community, including leadership by Dale Peters, who will be sharing a bit shortly, and, and the chamber. Uh, both Dale and, and I were able to participate in a really um, lengthy and meaty chamber conversation about how do we do this successfully in Eau Claire and not only contain disease, critically important, and we have a healthcare industry in this community that cares a lot as a business about containing disease, but also safely and strategically reopening and being smart about that and having the resources and tools so that our businesses and our sectors that will be reopening over the next number of months um, can do that in a way that they feel confident with. Um, so we're using science and best practice and using the input from community partners to make that happen. So I will um, now turn it over to Dale and then to Dave to share a bit about our next steps to do that work. Um, I'll be back at the end to um, field questions and share some closing comments. And I'm sure that Dale and Dave and I all will be available for that um, closing time as well. So Dale. Thank you, Liska. We all know that in order to slow the spread of COVID-19 and keep our health care systems safe and from being overwhelmed, we have implemented these physical distancing practices and the closures that have been required and that we've been working on. We also know that these measures have saved lives and they have slowed the spread of disease. But these measures have also significantly impacted our economy at the national, state, and local level. And there's a lot of discussion and ideas about how and when to safely restart the economy. And I hope that despite different ideas and approaches, that everyone can agree that we want an, ec an economic recovery that does not take us backwards. And as we prepare to reopen the economy, it should be done with a strategic, data-driven approach to make sure that we do not reopen an economy so quickly that we overwhelm our ability to contain disease spread in the healthcare system. And again, I hope that we can all agree we do not want to be going backwards and we do not want to undo the good work that has been done and we do not want to have to start over. But how do we reopen an economy in a way that minimizes the impact of disease, protects employers, employees, residents, and visitors? And how do we help whole sectors of our economy safely restart? Well, I can certainly tell you I don't have all those answers. 
However, there are a lot of smart, talented, and motivated people in the Chippewa Valley that working together can find a path forward. Work that will be challenging and require coordination and cooperation. As Lisa mentioned, our incident command system has been working for several weeks on planning for a recovery. And today we're here to announce the formation of a Chippewa Valley COVID-19 Economic Recovery Task Force. Now you may ask, who are we? Well, we are a whole collection of people. The County Administrator, Catherine Schaff, Mike Golat from the City of Altoona, the Chamber, other economic development agencies, our Health Department, our Incident Command Structure, as well as many local businesses and business leaders. But of course, because of limitations of physical distancing, we all could not be up here together standing, uh, and, and I am here to announce this uh, collaborative effort. The formation of the Chippewa Valley COVID-19 Economic Task Force is an effort to pull together resources, organizations, and talent from across the Chippewa Valley to help us emerge from this crisis in an orderly, successful, safe, and stronger position. Some of the objectives of the task force include working with health professionals and the incident command structure to provide consistent, evidence-based guidance for businesses to incrementally return to work and work-related activities. We want to develop ideas and initiatives to restart and promote specific sectors of our economy. We want to facilitate resources for local businesses and successfully promote the entire community and communicate the recovery plans. At the same time, we'll be working to connect employers and employees and ensure the health and safety of our residents, employees, and visitors while engaged in local commerce, all while keeping a focus and an eye on minimizing the impact of disease. Now, one does not have to look hard or far to find some extreme positions on suggesting how to proceed forward. The task force is mobilizing as a community-wide collaborative effort to take measured and coordinated and safe path forward for our economic recovery. Some of you may know I like to sail, and when I'm out on the big water, I cannot always pick the waves that I get to sail in. I can, however, choose the sails that we have up, the crew that we're going to work with, the crew and how they're going to work together, and we can decide how we're going to steer through those waves. Together as a community, we may not be able to choose the size of the waves that are in front of us, but we can choose to actively and strategically sail through them rather than let them knock us over. This is going to be a challenging and difficult work, but together I am confident we're going to be able to chart a course through these rough waters. And with that, I think we turn it over to Dave. You're so eloquent with your sailing. Wow, I like that. Again, my name is Dave Miner. I'm president and CEO for the Eau Claire Area Chamber of Commerce. First thing I want to start off with, because again, with the governor's recent announcements, you know, and everybody feeling pretty much on one side or the other of this issue right now, I want to be very clear about this. I have talked to over hundreds and hundreds of chamber members, businesses in the Chippewa Valley area. Not one, not one person has said they want to open without taking precautions for their customers and for their employees. We all know going forward there is no going back to doing business the way we did it. Every business, every operation is going to change to some degree. So please, again, I just want to be very clear. Nobody that I've talked to has said, I want to open and put anybody in any kind of harm. The passion, and that needs a big part of what you need to understand. The small businesses of our community have a passion for their business, or they wouldn't be in it. This is not the big companies. These are not the well-funded corporations around the world. These are small businesses in our community that depend on business here to employ the people, their family, their friends. So is it critical that we get opened? Yes, but to what has been said, we have to do it in a way that they can do so properly, protect their employees, protect their customers. As Liska said, we had both Dale and Liska part of our chamber board meeting Tuesday morning. Dale presented and, and talked about what he just unveiled here and the chamber board is in full endorsement of this. Out of 30 board members, I have 15 who have stepped up and offered to play a role on those committees, on those task force, different, and there's many different ways and roles for people to do that. 
We are looking at how all of my staff, including myself, can help take on some of those administrative roles. So those people who are chairing committees, those people who are chairing the whole task force, have support. They're not simply just trying to do it all. We can use their expertise, let them focus on what they need to do, because many of these people who have great ideas, who want to see this solved, are also running a business or they're taking their own small business. So we want to try and make their involvement time-wise as little as we can. I'll be reaching out to some of my counterparts and some of the other organizations to ask for that support as well. So when those individuals come together in this task force, they're focused on what needs to be done. Tomorrow for our town hall meeting, uh, the second half, the first part of our, our, our hour show, 30 minutes, will be with Senator Tammy Baldwin. But the second part will be with Dale and myself, Scott Rogers, and the chamber board chair, Scott Biederman, talking about what does this task force look like? Where do we need people? What areas do we need people? Because as Dale said, we need everybody to help us find solutions, to create them. We've already reached out to the Hotel Motel Association, the restaurant, the Tavern League. What guidelines are they putting in place? What guidelines do they have that they can share? Again, one of the things that I've said for 27 plus years in the chamber world, I can take resources from other organizations, other chambers, and get them to our members that desperately need them. So a couple of things I would ask, if you have a recovery plan for your business and you're willing to share it, please do so because there are a number of businesses that don't have that, that never thought something like this was ever going to happen or come their way. The last two things I just want to share is again, these small businesses, they are the backbone, not just of the Chippewa Valley, but of our country. But again, those are the businesses when as a community, you wanted to go raise money for your cause, whatever that was, from Little League softball to football to school to programs, you name it. These are the businesses that you went to to ask for donations. I can't stress enough today that please do everything you can. Buy gift cards, order from them, do something that supports them. Show them that you want them to be here when we come out of this, whenever that is. Second, we are going to start working with our elected delegation here in the, in the Chippewa Valley area to again look at how can we open regionally under safe guidelines, meeting metrics, using the science, but not necessarily waiting for the rest of the state to get to the same part. As a country, the federal government has said, we understand some states are going to open before others because they don't have the same level of cases. The state needs to look at that same thing. So again, looking at the science, looking at the metrics, but understanding we are going to start meeting. We want to start asking that question. How do we open as a region? How can we get back to what the new normal is going to be? Again, well, let me tell you, most businesses, 99.9, .9, are going to come out of this and operate in a different way than we've ever seen before. That's how business responds. But we need you to support them. We need them there. And again, I will close with this. I've not talked to a single business that has said, I want to open and I don't care. Everyone has said, I want to protect my employees. I want to protect my customers. I want to get back to what I love doing. And that is running my small business. Thank you. So thanks both to Dale and to Dave for the work that um, they are doing. Um, I think one of the things that I see as I sit on lots of statewide calls and I'm engaged in a lot of statewide efforts is that we have um, an amazing community here. It's not true everywhere. And I think one of the things I see and feel regularly is that there's shared interest in having a strong Eau Claire. And uh, even though people have different opinions, the ability to work in partnership, which doesn't always happen. So I, I want to say that that is encouraging to me in this situation, that there may be different thoughts about how we move forward and what we do, but people are ready to roll up their sleeves and start working together, and there's a real interest in that. Um, I have also um, equally heard that there is important perspective and important priority that we do things smartly and strategically and that we protect people in this community as well. 
So again, in closing, um, a few uh, reminders. So coronavirus.echealthdepartment.org is our website that does provide links to lots of other places for information. Our call center is 715-831-7425. Um, a reminder to everybody that um, we want people to stay safe. A reminder to keep your circle small. It will make a difference long term. And the smaller the circles are, the fewer people that will get the disease as, as that starts spreading in any community. So we are counting on you for that. And we, um, we know that this is a community that cares about one another and that we can do that. So we will open it up to questions for the three of us. And um, certainly, depending on where the questions go, we'll have different people up here. So any questions? Yes. Um, you had mentioned the, uh, the Trump numbers from yesterday and uh, saying that increased testing is, is part of that. Is that the main reason why we're seeing those larger numbers? Is there something else that comes into play? Can you maybe speak on that? Sure. So the question is related to the statewide testing number or statewide positive numbers that we do have over 200 positives today announced, which is a little bit of an increase compared to previous um, positive increases. It's likely related to a whole variety of factors. Increased testing could be part of that. We also have a number of outbreaks happening right now. Clark County, the example I gave earlier, Brown County, where there are a significant number of people that are um, positive cases and there's more intensive testing happening because of the kind of congregate settings that are there. So a variety of reasons that those positives are there. Um, but it is also a reminder to all of us that we do have COVID-19 continuing to circulate despite having a very specific safer at home um, order in place. Yes. Uh I'm not sure if it, I think it was today that you posted parades are not permitted under the safer at home order. Please find other ways to celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, and other milestones. Is that, is that today? Yeah, so the posting um, was asked about was that today. We did do a posting um, today because we're getting a lot of questions about that uh, related to parades. Um, parades are not in the current order um, considered an allowable activity, and that is really based on the public health science of disease spread. So again, if you think about a parade and the opportunities for people in their excitement because it is related to a joyful and family focused activity uh, typically, those situations really provide all kinds of opportunity of risk of transmission and that activity is not allowable under the current order. Yes, yeah, so if I could just follow up. Uh, so there were, uh, as of just moments before this news conference, there were 463 comments, 427 shares. It seemed to be mm -hmm. overwhelmingly negative. Uh, people saying that you're, it's not a king's edict and that uh, people are not locked in their house. I mean, kind of a pushback on it. Mm -hmm. um, are you open at all to the suggestion that possibly uh, it borders on overreach and that people feel uh, stifled by it? So the question related to parades is there have been, there are, people that are concerned about the order that does not allow that type of activity currently and am I concerned about that being really not necessary or an overreach. The existing order is working. We have a decrease and a flattening in the positives that are coming through in our community and every community across the state. The public health measure of keeping your circle small and not spreading disease right now is what we critically need in order to not only stop disease now, but have the tools for containment, that two-armed strategy is reopen and contain. We need both of those, and those are things that are being actively, locally worked on as well as at a state level. It is a challenge for people. It's hard for all of us to be at home and not have those activities. We encourage people to find additional ways to have those activities happen. Um, and, and it's important that we're connecting with people in all kinds of ways. Um, we hope that this will be safe to do soon. The better we do with staying home, keeping our circle small, um, the better we will be able to soon have those kinds of events continue. 
And lastly, uh, related to that, there was a, a you voiced a, a change in this policy to us on Monday that was born out in an article in the Leader Telegram today, a seventh grade uh, girl in Altoona who uh, persuaded you that it would be uh, allowable for educational purposes. But uh, within the uh, post, at least within the thread, a number of school districts were tagged and that seemed to be creating some confusion as to, uh, I presume you're not backing off from the change you voiced on Monday, but could you clarify why the school mm -hmm. districts were tagged? Sure. So the question is related to um, these posts that are being discussed and asked about related to parades also include some comment and some connection to some recent media reports about school parades. Um, school events for educational purposes have never been not allowed, although the article that you are citing did say that there was a change in interpretation. There was not. Um, the interpretation has been consistent that the, for educational purposes, it is possible for educators to be out. Um, and we continue to discourage those situations where it's not necessary. That's been a consistent message to whether it's a teacher and an educational leader, um, but it's not ever been disallowed, even though it was reported that way and the student that was concerned about it did talk about it as a disallowed activity and we clarified that it was not disallowed. Um, it, it certainly is being interpreted differently in the media. So um, the ability for teachers to connect with students in a variety of ways is critical and is being managed under the education system, which is very different than a family function to celebrate a retirement. The purpose of what we are trying to do is keep the, um, the opportunity for spread of disease as small as possible. And I think we all understand the importance of that right now. As soon as we can make those changes, the better for all of us. And we need to pay attention to the science and the data to show us that we are ready to do that in the state. Yes. The time frame we have we would be hopefully before the end of May. Again, I think it's the working with, with all parties to how do we do that? Again, how do we protect those businesses, their employees, their customers? Are we meeting the metrics? You know, there's certain things. That's why this partnership is strong, because there's certain things from our standpoint, and I'll say from the business standpoint, we have to abide by somebody else setting the rules, in this case, the governor. So it's we, but our goal is to sit down with our, our delegation from the Chippewa Valley area. So this really is, is looking at it as a Chippewa alliance, which when we normally go down to, to Madison, is working with those to say, if we meet those, we need your help to persuade the governor or whoever to let us do business sooner than other areas and not hold the whole state till Milwaukee or Madison have met those have met those measures. So the question is, what is the health department? What's our incident command um, approach right now to reopening? We are continuing to work at a state level to look at all strategies to make sure that we can strategically and safely reopen. Those measures are at a state level. Um, and importantly, I think we all need to remember that um, it is only a matter of time before we see disease at higher levels. And we will see that with any reopen, um, being prepared and being ready for that is critically important and um, at this point we don't have all those pieces in place. We are following the governor's order and um, the governor is very interested and has communicated clearly that as we are able to open 
um, sooner than the date in May, um, we will and can. Um, we are not at a place right now to do that, and um, the Chippewa Valley is included in that, um, that measure. I think we can remember that if you're watching local media, Clark County recently had a death, recently had a, a big jump in cases for a very small county, and that is a, that's a neighboring county, so that's part of our catchment area here, and it's important that we all remember that as we move forward. We certainly know that regional conversations are being had around the state and around the nation, um, and we are a state as a whole. So at this point, we are working under the order as a statewide order, and we will continue to work with partners, including um, the chamber and um, the task force. Obviously, that's a critical part of how we move forward and get ready in this region. Uh, with the governor's order being challenged by the Supreme Court, uh, if the Supreme Court comes back and says that he's overstepping his bounds and that the initial end date, which is this Friday, uh, will hold, how do you guys perceive if the governor's order is, I guess, overturned by the Supreme so the question is related to the Supreme Court case that is in place now um, to overturn the governor's order that is in existence for moving forward. It would mean that at 8 a.m. on Friday, this Friday, that the existing order would end, and if the new order is not in place or it is changed, we will be adapting to that reality. I think everybody in the Chippewa Valley understands, and, and really everybody in the state understands that Nothing is not a solution. We can't, that's not a safe next step for us. It's the White House doesn't say that. Um, the governor's office doesn't say that. None of the national researchers say that. All of the data shows that we can't be reopened right now. That is widely circulated by many. Um, and that that date is well into May, even with the current predictions. So we'll be working um, at a local level as well as a state level to um, find solutions to that question when and if it happens. Um, but we're confident that that the right decision moving forward to keep a safe Wisconsin will be in place. It is um, a concern and a question, and um, our job with the measures that are, have been laid out, the White House plan as well as the state bounce back plan, are to turn the dial progressively, not start and stop. Any additional questions? Um, if when you talk to people who are tested positive, and um, I guess what is the process of finding out the origin of it if it's not travel related? What is the process that you guys go through to try to um, maybe go back in line and try to figure out you know, where it originated from? Yeah, so the question is really about what's our process to try and figure out where the case originated from. During an outbreak like this, we do do some work on that. Our first important work is to make sure that person is isolated as the sick individual and all of their contacts are looked at and told to quarantine so we don't have spread. That's what containment means. So our very first strategy is to work on that. As part of the very in-depth interview process that's done, that individual is asked about their past history and where they've been and who they've been in close contact with. And we've talked a couple of times about the very specific definition of close contact. So right now, I've not had any close contact with anybody in this room. So if I was a positive tomorrow, none of you would get that phone call. But um, you also would not be presumed to have given me the disease if you are positive tomorrow. The, um, the tracing back of that is complicated because it's hard for people to remember. It is much easier, frankly, now that we have Safer at Home because people have much less um, exposure to others and the places that they could have gotten the disease are many fewer. Typically, the diseases in our community and across the state have been either because of travel, and those were our initial cases, and now because of contact to a positive case, and they're very easy to connect that way. Curious what if you've had any interaction with chamber members who 
plan to go and what would be your message to those who plan to go or, or, or not? I've not heard from anybody here. I, um, to be honest, I had not even heard there was a rally in Madison on Friday. So um, right now I'm so focused on taking care of the businesses in this area. Um, some of my staff are kind of taking care of all of that. You know, again, uh, you know, we still live in a country where people can 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 share their belief and their ideas and their concerns. Um, I, I think in any way, the, the one thing we cannot argue is that this is a disease. People can catch it from people. So, you know, the, the simple thing of people feel that they need to go or have to go, um, maybe surround yourself with a couple of hula hoops about six feet out and keep away from everybody else. Um, you know, again, this... The part of this is people are passionate on all sides. And, and, and what I would and really ask people is, if you want to talk about it, do it logically with the facts. Not your version, but the facts that are really there and talk about it. But if, if people want to go to Madison and, and, and do something, just do it properly and, and, and do it respectfully. Um, you know, being part of this world for, uh, in the chamber world for 30 years, watching people do these things, I can tell you those elected individuals will listen to the ones who are talking to them in a reasonable tone, in a reasonable way, and not shelling, sh shouting and calling them names and doing everything else. As a human being, we tune those people out, unfortunately. So, um, you know, again, I would leave it with just do it and do it carefully if that's where you feel you need to be. Just a quick kind of a fun follow-up. You're known for your love of Disney movie, D Disney. Yep. Is there a Disney movie that you could, that you have been drawing inspiration from that you might be able to share with us as we kind of battle this monster collectively? Um, any Disney movie you want to watch will take you away from the rest of the world and let you enjoy that for a while. Um, really what I'm paying attention to right now is what Disney is doing as a company to get themselves through this because you are talking a company that deals with more people on a daily basis as employees and, and customers and guests than anybody else. And so that's where I'm paying a lot of attention to how are they getting themselves through this. But if you want to leave the world, just literally watch any Disney movie and you will literally get away for two hours and some time. And remember, Disney has always put Easter eggs and jokes in for us parents, even though the movie is made for kids. So I learned something about Dave, the love of Disney movies or those kids' movies. It's a good, it's a good recommendation for people to do some self-care and if they get a chance to get a movie from the library or, or find a movie uh, uh, online to do that. Any additional questions? Yes? Uh, there was uh, a big plant in Iowa that had to shut down because they had a big outbreak of, um, in, uh, of COVID within their employees. Well, what is the process of being informed of if that were to happen locally? There's a larger facility that has a large number of people that, that got something, or maybe a lot of it's traced back to a store. Um, at what point does the health department notify public? Um, is it up to the store? Is it up to mm -hmm. you guys? I guess what is the process behind that? Okay, so the question is related to what happens if there's an, a large outbreak similar to what happened in Iowa related to a facility and the, and the facility itself. It would be very dependent. What would we do? How would, how would the community know? How would people know about that outbreak? Um, those situations are very dependent on the details of that situation. Um, right now, for example, if there is um, a case of COVID-19 in a long-term care facility, it's considered an outbreak, and it would that term would be used. But we certainly wouldn't identify um, that that place had an outbreak in the same kind of way as if, if there you know, was a cruise ship, like we've seen um, early on, a specific cruise ship with many, many people in Infected. So it would be very dependent on the situation. Certainly um, any situation where the community may be at risk. We have lots of examples of foodborne outbreak where there's very clear public messaging so people know if they potentially were in contact with that food, if there was a foodborne outbreak, that they get the information publicly and know about it quickly. So we have lots of processes in place to protect people in the community. And we also have processes in place to protect privacy, both and in that situation. Lisa, if I just add one piece to that. 
nationally, I think right now there are five plants that, that have been shut down. But if people are concerned about, you know, where, where maybe that meat is coming or whatever, we have a lot of local farms. Again, talking about supporting people in our area, there are a lot of local farms that you know that are part of the farm market during the summertime, but that deliver. It's frozen. There are resources here people can support if that is something that they're concerned about. Any additional questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what facility have we identified for surge capacity? We are still working through the contracting arrangements with that. So right now, you know, as soon as we have a facility um, lined up with that, we have it secured, we have walked through, and we have a team working on all of the details. And so right now, we're not just closing the specific place, but we will as soon as we are able to. Yes? Um, Facebook post today from a influential person in Chippewa Falls that it linked an article from Madison, painful pay cuts, furloughs to hit Madison hospitals. Just, uh, it seems to me, again, I know we're going back to the basics, but the idea of uh, flatten the curve to not overrun our hospitals. And yet people, I think, overwhelmingly continue to be confused because they feel like not only are overwhelmingly the hospitals not overrun, we've got pay cuts and furloughs. So again, I'm just inviting you to speak to that because sure. So some recent um, communication in the media about um, in Madison some potential pay cuts and furloughs for healthcare um, employees in that area. I'm not familiar with the specific article, but we do know that there have been some cases for specific parts of our healthcare system that are not currently able to operate um, that they are um, employees have been impacted so we do have awareness of that across the state and across the area um, and that is hugely um, challenging for those individuals. Uh, what has been happening in those settings is that the hospitals have had to really prioritize their care, make sure that they have space available and the planning available to treat large numbers. And as we move from where we're at now with the numbers that we have to um, the ability to support um, people that are having elective surgeries and those kinds of things, I'm confident that our healthcare systems will quickly be back in place. That's one of the sectors that we will be working on with in, o in the Eau Claire area and have been working on with to make sure that they are able to be at work and working. Other questions? So thank you very much. Um, we are happy again to be with you today. Um, we'll be back on Friday with an update um, and sharing about COVID-19 in the Eau Claire area. Um, we appreciate you paying attention and thank you. Make sure that you are sharing this with people in your, in your communities. Thanks.